The Eston Hills in the Cleveland district of the North Riding of Yorkshire. Mining engineer John Marley arrives with ironmaster John Vaughan of the Middlesbrough iron making firm Bolko and Vaughan. They're searching for new supplies of ironstone to feed their furnaces and secure a struggling enterprise. Having driven a distance of five miles from Middlesbrough, Mr. Vaughan and I, John Marley, left the carriage at the bottom of the hill and began our ascent on foot. The existence of ironstone in the district had been known since medieval times. In more recent years, many had tried to ascertain its worth and had failed, being told that it was simply good for nothing. We, nonetheless, carefully examined pieces of stone that we came across, and at about halfway found the first pieces of this fabled iron stone. I knew it! I knew it! I think, Mr. Vaughan, I do think one should see this. What is it, Marley? What do you have there? Let me see. What does one make of this nugget? Hmm. Most curious. This is nonsense, young man. You're pulling my leg. No, Jackie, I'm quite serious. It cannot be. You must have brought this from Skinning Grove. <laughs> Not true, sir. It cannot be. The previous day had been spent at the firm's mine along the coast. But then Mr. Vaughan himself also found a piece of the stone. Marley, look at this. I don't believe it. I've thought about this so many times. I've surely walked upon it many times, shooting. This is the Skinning Grove scene. Without question, sir. But that stone has never seen Skinning Grove. That would appear so. Come, there must be more. Then, almost racing up the hill, we entered the Lowther Estate. And there we found the outcrop, upwards of some 16 feet lying bare. Look at it, Marley. Look at it. Astonishing. It's in abundance here. What must that be? 15 feet? I think more. I think possibly 16 or more. And it appears to have no shale running through it. This is utterly remarkable. I mean, no doubt about it. This is truly momentous. The seam did not resemble traditional ironstone, and so its value had passed unrecognized until this moment. This seam must extend back to Skinning Grove. It only begs me to wonder, to, to marvel at the potential of such a prospect. Of course, for celebration, sir. Indeed. And so the true commercial discovery of Cleveland ironstone was made. On the 8th of June, 1850, the Great Iron Rush began. The capitalists and opportunists, the desperate and the destitute, they all made their way to this English El Dorado. Along the Tees, marshy riverbanks, unchanged over centuries, were suddenly awash with development as the new masters claimed their territories and reclaimed the land. At the forefront were Bolko and Vaughan, building blast furnaces at Middlesbrough and the prime site of Eston Junction just two and a half miles from the ore. In the hills, a feverish scramble also ensued as mining royalties were snapped up along the new ironstone frontier. A method of tunnelling known as drift mining was spreading fast across the ore field, from Normanby to New Mask along the northern scarp, at Gisborough, Swainby and Rosedale to the south, and along the coast from Huntcliffe to Port Mulgrave. To the mines and ironworks were drawn the pilgrims of need, arriving in their thousands from every corner of Britain and Ireland. From Durham, Cumberland and Cornwall came the miners of coal, lead and tin to lead the way. Behind them, peasant farmers many walking from Norfolk and Lincolnshire, trading a life of toil on the land for the chance of a better one beneath.
In just 20 years, the Cleveland district had become the world's iron-producing capital. Along the Tees towered more than 100 blast furnaces. Across Cleveland, some 40 mines were in operation, including the deep pits of North Skelton, Lumpsey, Kilton and Lingdale. Landor Prade, a reporter from the Newcastle Daily Chronicle, returned to Tyneside inspired. The unaccustomed traveller fancies himself sweeping over the crust of a smouldering planet. This whole land blazes with manufacturing volcanoes. It had no place in history, not even the faintest mark on the map. And now it is blazing, booming, enterprising. It is a mine of wealth below, and a treasury above. Every hour, it increases the wealth of the nation. From the steel boom of the 1880s to the insatiable demand of the Great War, Cleveland continued to supply up to 40% of Britain's iron stone. But in the 1920s, as many of the smaller pits became exhausted or fell victim to the slump, production declined rapidly. Only a handful of pits had survived into the 1950s, and all of them were drawing to a close. By 1964, all were abandoned bar one. And on the 17th of January, at North Skelton, the last stone left Cleveland's last pit, and the industry was gone. 